everybody, I'm Tom Basso. Welcome back to the Dice Tower and our show that's all about crowdfunding. And so in this show, we take a look at uh, Kickstarters and I want to talk real briefly about that just because we do this show. I want it to be as independent here as possible with this show as to what I pick and what I put on the show. So if you send me and say, hey, please talk about my Kickstarter, we might, but we might not. Because really, we just want to talk about whatever we're interested in talking about. Uh, we're going to talk about the Kickstarters that I find intriguing or that I'm not interested in. And I'm going to tell you exactly what I think about them. Kind of uninformed opinions. But honestly, that's a lot of what Kickstarter is at this point in time. So with that being said, let's get to the news. Okay, let's take a look here at some of the Kickstarters. Uh, I'm starting with how soon it's going to end, and we'll go on to the end. Secret Cabal podcast is having a Kickstarter. It's ending in a few days. Uh, Secret Cabal is part of the Dice Tower Network, so of course we really like these guys. This one is so that Jamie Keggy can go full-time. It's always a big leap of faith to do that, although I wasn't really that worried for him. The Secret Cabal podcast uh, audience is quite large and quite loyal. So this one has blasted through, got to stretch goals, and he'll be doing videos uh, with that along with the audio podcast from The Secret Cabal. Ray Guns and Rocket Ships. Now this one from IDW has some really cool miniatures in it. Uh, it's designed by Scott Rogers, who's not actually known as a board game designer, but as a video game designer. He's the God of War and Pac-Man world. Um... It, it's, it, they talk about that there's programming in this game and it has a dual scale system, which means there's one board where you're moving your ship around and then there's other boards where you have the crew of your ship. I like the crew, the Astro Rangers, the Zard, the Star Pirates, um, the Borg. Uh, it has a very, you know, 50s, 60s kind of retro feel to it. Looks silly fun. And I'm hoping it, basically I'm hoping it's as good as it looks. Fantasy Fantasy Football is there. Uh, Sam had a chance to play this one. He told me that it's basically you're drafting the players. It's not actually a game of football, but it's about drafting them and winning games over a season. Uh, it's in a fantasy universe, which I guess means we can have the funny name Fantasy Fantasy Football, although that doesn't really appeal to me that much, but maybe it's good. My game of the week here is Dead Men's Doubloons. This is the one that looks really fascinating to me. Two to five players, 30 to 45 minutes, pirate games with plastic ships. I'm especially fascinated by the translucent plastic ghost pirate ships. That's really neat looking, and I think that's a cool addition. But this one seems like it fits in there, has a lot of cool components, and a light or Euro-style strategy game. Uh, there's Pirates can make for a fun, frothy theme. This one, I think, well, I'm hoping, is really good. Affordable Dice Towers and Trays, that's not probably the best name, although it's accurate. These are wooden dice towers uh, that are fairly affordable. We're like 40 bucks or so for a dice tower compared to what some of the other companies charge for dice towers. The only thing I don't like about these is the little hole in the top. It seems like it's difficult to that, you know, you can't throw a handful of dice into them easily. Roxley Games is smashing it up as always. Not as always, but they've only done a few Kickstarters, but they've done really well with each of them, and this one is no exception. Getting Brass from Martin Wallace, one of the highest rated games of all time, this heavy economic game, and giving it an absolute gorgeous overhaul. I mean, the game just looks so much better. The original Brass was just not that fantastic looking. This one looks much, much better. They also have Brass Birmingham. So there's Brass Lancashire, that's the original, and Brass Birmingham. This is a sequel of sorts. Uh, uses a lot of the same systems. Sounds like there's more variety and setup in this one, but they're both economic transportation, canal, train type games. So uh, this, this one's just really smashing up on Kickstarter. Uh, Dungeon Dice from Potluck Games. Uh, this is the uh, the new boxed version of this one is out. Um, it has a really odd video, which didn't make any sense at all, but I've played Dungeon Dice before. Dungeon Dice is a simple game where you're rolling dice, trying to you know, just kill monsters with dice. The dice are okay quality, not amazing, but they're, they're decent quality. And the way the stretch goals of this campaign work, where you keep unlocking them after all, shows that the campaign's gonna do really well. So the more people back it, you can get a whole ton of dice for this. And it's, I think, I'm pretty sure it's compatible with the other Dungeon Dice games. 
This one really has me intrigued, and that's werewolf coins. Now, I've taught a lot of games of werewolf where you give people cards, whether it's one eye ultimate, or I'm not sorry, ultimate werewolf or mafia or whatever it is. You give them the cards, and then people hold the cards, and they stick the cards in their pockets or whatever, and sometimes the cards get bent. This is a coin for each player, so you pull them from a bag, and then you have the coin. I really like this idea. This is a really neat thing. Um, the idea of using a coin, it's not going to get banned or anything. People can slide it in their pockets. So I wouldn't, you know, I'm, there's a lot enough werewolf type games out there, but this is a good idea for one. Another ancient, not ancient, but an older game brought back that was very highly regarded. We already mentioned Brass. Now we're talking about Hannibal. Um, this one here from Phalanx Games, designed by Mark Sinowich, uh, is just, it's a, one of the biggest, well-regarded war games. I've played it once. There's a lot going on in it. It has a card combat system. This one has plastic generals. Um, if you recall, this was reprinted once before, then that company went out of business. Um, they also have Hamel Carr, which is the name of Hannibal's father. And this is a sea battle. It's a separate game in the same universe. But the pieces here, once again, look gorgeous. The art looks good. I think this one will do well. Custom dice. D20 dice ties. Of course, I'm going to talk about ties. I like ties. I like to wear ties. I didn't back this one, though. Why? Because they're too thin. The thin tie thing is a young person's game these days. I'm more... I don't want super fat ties, but I want them to be a decent width. And... They're very generic D20s. I, I don't know. They look okay. I, I don't dislike them, but I don't think I'd go out of my way to get them either. Top Hats and Treachery. This is interesting. The cover looks different than the game itself. It's a take that game. Every person, they, they have a whole lot of testimonials from people who like the game. They're like, a fun take that game. It's an entertaining, silly take that game. And I'm, every time I hear the word take that and nothing else, I'm getting a little concerned. And the artwork is a little disconcerting because the front of the box looks like all silly. Then inside is like real people. And I think that's kind of the, the humor in the game. Hey, look, Charles Darwin did this and, and whatever did this. And okay, Ralph Al Waldo Emerson and Charles Darwin are hanging out. Maybe it's okay. We'll see. Uh, reload. Now, this one, I think Reload is load again with newer miniatures. Definitely miniatures. I have a copy of Load um, here. I haven't played it and we will play it and review it. There was certainly controversy with the first load because it looked like that they had just taken the rules for Roman Bones and basically plagiarized them uh, to the point where there was like even mentions of pirates and even there's no pirates in load. I'm not sure what happened and who's right or wrong there, but I'll tell you what, if you look at this project, you look at the comments from the people who, who talk about it, them talking about that, it, it's like, are you talking about the game ever? Because all anyone talks about is how, how amazing the miniatures are. The miniatures are amazing looking, but I hope the game is good also. Tesla vs. Edison Duel. This is from Artana Games. They made a game from Tesla vs. Edison. This was a uh, kind of an economic game, uh, stock market style game. This one looks like it's very different. This one here uh, from Dirk and also Jerry Honeycutt. Uh, the comments were like, hey, it's like Seven Wonders Duel. Okay, that's kind of interesting. So it's a two-player card game version. I really like the theme, so let's hope that's good. Clans of Caledonia, this one, or Whiskey Trading Glory. This one looks like a very involved uh, Euro-style game, modular board, eight different clans, each with a unique power. But where this one gets me is that the designer of this game, it's his first Kickstarter, but he did a game a few years ago called Green Deal, which I thought was a really excellent game. I didn't think it was going on. I'm like, oh, this doesn't look like much. I played it, and it was really a fantastic game. So I'm hoping this game is as good as as Green Deal was. Early talk about it is pretty high. Fantasy Defense. This is a cooperative card game. A tower defense card game, if you will. But they say, hey, once you beat it, whether solo or co-op, you will unlock more content to make it harder. It gets harder each time you go through it. Skyways. Here's another one. This one almost made my pick of the month because I really like this game from Jeffrey Allers. I've never played Skyways, but I played the game it was based on, which is called Heartland, to the point where I tried to get Heartland for the Dice Tower Essentials. It's a mean tile laying game where you're trying to get control different things. Heartland was different uh, farmer plots and control them and three dimensional tile laying game. Well, this one's the same way, but it's with cities. Really neat plastic pieces. This one's from Eagle Griffin Game. I'm pretty pumped about it. Bullets and Teeth. This is a casual. I just thought that was funny. They put the word casual in here. Animal zombie game. 
It's a 20 minute card game where basically it's that whole, I don't need to outrun the bear, I just need to outrun you. It says you got one bullet, a bear with three heads, and a friend with two kneecaps. What do you shoot? <laughs> So that's kind of mean, I guess, but it's 20 minutes, it's fast and silly. It looks like a zombie game I might be more interested in because the animals are like more mutants than zombies. They're all kinds of animals chasing after you and you have to escape them from last ditch games. Not a bad uh, name for a company. You can get personalized casino dice on Kickstarter. Eh, I don't know, I'd rather have personalized regular dice, but if you want those perfectly balanced casino dice, you can get them now for yourself. Dogmite Games. Now, Dogmite Games are the people who make this dice tower here. This is one of my favorite dice towers because it looks like the dice tower. I met them a few years ago at Origins. I've always thought they were an excellent company. And now they are making skirmish boxes as a place to keep your miniatures. In fact, they even have a way to get Malifaux logos on, and it's specifically made for some weird miniatures. But it come, you can get these magnets. You put these magnets on the bottom of your miniatures. And when you're done, you stick your miniatures in this box and you can turn it upside down and the miniatures don't fall off. That's not a terrible idea. The, minute, the magnets won't affect your miniatures as you're moving around the board, but putting them in the box and then them staying there, nice. I'm really interested in that. And the last thing we're talking about today is Gardens of Mars. This is from Nestor Andres. Uh, he has done a whole pile of games. They come a little pencil case type things, prints them out themselves, but this one is not from him. It's from Big Kid Games. It's a bigger nicer version of his game, an abstract strategy game. I've not played it, but Z Garcia says it is quite good. So that's the news for today. Let's move on. Hey friends, Chubby Meeple here to chat quickly, uh, briefly about uh, Kickstarter. I uh, love being a part of the crowd surfing show here with Tom and everyone and uh, being a contributor to that. But uh, the game I want to talk about here, one I've uh, had an opportunity to play a prototype of uh, and had a really good time with, is a co-op game called Code Triage. Uh, in Code Triage, um, up to four players are placed in the roles of emergency room workers. One person is a nurse, one is a patient representative, one is a radiology technician, and the fourth person is a medical technician. Um, within the emergency room themselves. Um, you're always going to have those four characters. It plays up to four people, so depending on how many people you're playing, you know, how many people are actually playing the game, um, you have to split those four characters up. And you have to play with all four because you're going around, you're fulfilling doctor's orders on patients that are coming into the ER. You're working cooperatively to discharge more patients um, than are uh, leaving against medical advice or um, you know, just passing away under your care. Um, and if you ever lose three of those patients, um, you, you lose the game if three patients die on you. So um, it's, a, it's a fun little co-op game. Uh, it'll be hitting Kickstarter coming here on May the 3rd. Uh, so definitely keep your eyes out for that if this seems like something that might interest you. Uh, again, it's a fun little co-op game. Uh, there are ways to kind of tweak some of the mature content, uh, the more mature content anyway, to make it more family friendly, more uh, kid appropriate. Um, I had the chance to play this with the, the play the prototype with my 13 year old and my 10 year old. Uh, both of them absolutely had a blast with it. Um, you really were able to grasp the concept and the strategy behind it. So it's not a heavy game. Uh, I wouldn't say it's any heavier than like a pandemic kind of weight to it. Uh, so definitely if this interests you, check it out. May the 3rd, they'll be hitting Kickstarter. That is code triage from Brando Gameworks. I'm the Chubby Meeple. Until next time, keep gaming, friends. Tracy, the Gaming Maven here. I'm Stefan, the Games Teacher. And we're here to talk about a couple of Kickstarters that have recently caught our eye. So for me, it's a game called The Flow of History. It's designed by Jesse Lee and published by Tasty Minstrel Games. It's on Indiegogo. And I really liked it because uh, I, I like other games that Jesse Lee has done. I love TMG games. But what I like about this particular game is it has a bit of a take that element, which I'm starting to enjoy, but it's not a mean take that. I like it because you're trying to create, obviously, like it says, this flow of history. It's all about history, which matches a couple other games I enjoy. And what I like particularly about it is sometimes you will have to snipe a card from a fellow player. Except you have to be careful because you can actually benefit them by doing that. So you have mm. to balance out whether you're going to basically take the card and build your own empire a little bit better or, you know, chance helping your, own, your opponent in the end. Always some interesting choices to be made when you have the help them or, you know, help me aspect. So Exactly. And that's, I think, what intrigued me the most about this game. 
So the, the Kickstarter campaign that I'm looking at is Gardens of Mars. It's published by Big Kid Games, uh, designed by Nestor Romeral Andres, and with art by Andrew Rayford. The game is a dice drafting with uh, game with asymmetric player powers. It looks really great. Uh, the gameplay seems like it would be um, fairly simple to pick up. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing this one come out. It's a fairly new Kickstarter campaign, so it hasn't gotten a lot of traction yet, which is why I decided to highlight it on this segment. So like it's like we, we like to tend to pick a couple each that we both enjoy, and often we'll pick different games. As you can see, a dice abstract game versus a bit of a kind of strategy take that kind of game. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting uh, how many types of Kickstarter games are out there, and I'm just enjoying checking it all out. So again, not just Kickstarter, there's also Indiegogo and maybe other crowdfunding platforms that mm -hmm. we're not already familiar with. So if you know of any other crowdsourcing platforms where board games are highlighted, let us know in the comments and uh, we'll check them out. And for that for now, we'll see you later. Bye. Bye. I wanted to talk today about the second time through. I find it fascinating how successful Kickstarters, the biggest, biggest booms and excitement are the second time. And it seems like it's a fair thing. Sometimes someone comes out of nowhere and they have an extremely successful Kickstarter. But very rarely does someone come out of nowhere. Even some of the Kickstarters I mentioned today, um, where it might be their first game or something, they're not huge mega hits. They're big, but they're not huge. Or maybe it's a pre-existing property that they've worked on or what have you. But the second time, let's talk here about Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven just finished, and they finished just the tiniest bit shy of $4 million. That's pretty big for a giant game that's going to, you know, that, that, that's humongous. It costs a hundred bucks. It ha doesn't even have that many plastic miniatures in it. 200 hours of content. It's a fairly hefty, complex game, but it did really well because the first one did well. And then that led into a groundswell of support where people said, hey, this really is quite good, which makes the second one explode. We saw the same thing happen with Kingdom Death Monster, and we saw the same thing happen with Rising Sun. You say, wait a minute, there was no first edition of Rising Sun. There wasn't, but when people just started saying, hey, Japanese-themed Blood Rage, which isn't true, it's kind of an oversimplification of it, but the fact is people come in and say, I missed out the first time. So that's part of it, right? Oh, I missed out that first time, but this time I'm there. That's why movie sequels, even if they're not better, will often make more money than the original one because the word of mouth is like, wow, yeah, you saw that first one, it's really great. Let's go get the second one. Is that fair, some people say? Well, I think so. I, th I think there's a lot of, this isn't fair stuff that's bandied about and thrown at, at, at Kickstarter and that, that it shouldn't be, right? I think pretty much everything is fair game. You can hold the companies accountable for what they do. But uh, I, I like the idea of the proven system. Like say, hey, I think Gloomhaven was great the first time through. I saw a bunch of reviews. Now I can jump on board. And I also like this because it means that if you miss it the first time through for whatever reason, no one can be expected to have to watch Kickstarter for everything all the time. You can get it the second time through. And I think that's an excellent thing. I'm all, I'm all big fan of these second edition reprint type things because they give another generation of people who heard how good it was the first time a chance to play it again. And usually they end up doing really well. What do you guys think about that? Let me know in the comments, you know, about these, these Kickstarters that did okay or decent the first time, but then the second time a reprint or second edition or a sequel did amazing. You have one in particular you're thinking of? Let's talk about it. All right, let's keep going. I'm going to talk about an article I wrote called Your Idea is Brilliant, Your Idea is Worthless. This is one of the first articles I recommend people to uh, read when they're thinking about launching a Kickstarter campaign um, because most everything that is on Kickstarter starts out as an idea. You can't put it on Kickstarter as just an idea. You need to have developed it and designed it and play tested it and gotten art for it and all that stuff. Um, but this is really all early on in the process where, where all you have is an idea. And ideas are amazing. Um, I, I think it, like everything that's ever been invented that's awesome, every game that's ever been designed that's awesome started out with an idea um, that someone had and they, they actually pursued it. But that's the key part. 
Um, your idea is worthless unless you actually do something with it. I think it's our instinct, um, and it's certainly my instinct, to overvalue ideas. When I have a new idea uh, that I'm really excited about, I, my instinct is to covet it and, and just kind of cherish that brainstorming stage when, when the potential is infinite and when it, when it could be this awesome thing. But that stage um, isn't worth anything unless I actually build a prototype and do something with that idea. Um, so the, the key is to kind of to get out of that, that brain space of overvaluing and coveting this idea and move into a brain space of A, sharing the idea, because if you share it, um, you'll get some ideas from other people um, to help that idea. And someone might tell you, hey, that game, that exact game already exists. And if that happens, uh, that can be exciting because instead of spending a year of your life and tons of money and time designing it, you can just go buy that game and play it right away, which can be wonderful. Um, the other thing that you can do is actually do something with the idea and actually start to make it. Um, it's kind of daunting to, to actually do something with an idea, but I can tell you from personal experience, it's so gratifying to take that idea, take that fun brainstorming stage and actually make that first prototype, um, even though it's going to be terrible the first time you play it. At least then you'll have created something. You'll have taken something that's worthless, a concept, a, a nothing really, just an idea that's nothing, and you'll actually turn it into something real and tangible um, to see if it's any good. Um, and that's when your idea actually gains value. It's just a little bit of value, but it's, it's worth a lot more than when it was just uh, a spark in your, in your head. Uh, so that's, that's one of the early steps that, that I recommend anyone take when you have that idea to actually turn it into, into, from idea into something worthwhile, something of value, something tangible. Thanks, I'll be back later with uh, some of the next steps to take when you're thinking about running a Kickstarter campaign. I'm Mandy. And I'm Carol Tan. And today we're gonna be looking at some Kickstarters that we like or wanna give a little bit of extra love. So Carol, why don't you start? So this week, I'm looking at Fantasy Fantasy Football. It's a drafting and programming card game for two to six players by Daryl Andrews, J.R. Honeycutt, and art by Rob Lundy. In this game, you'll draft players for your team and program them in head-to-head -head matchups with your opponent's players. Any cards you don't program can be kept in hand for magical ability effects. Super tactical with weather effects to affect card choices, the simple, learn, easy-to-play game is my pick, because Daryl Andrews, who co-designed this game, also designed Sagrada, which is an amazing game that I'm enjoying currently. And he's Canadian. Yes, that is a plus. And I've actually played fancy fancy football and it is fun. And as a ex-competitive football player, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you looking at this week, Mandy? So I am also looking at another Canadian Kickstarter. We're not biased at all because we're Canadian. <laughs> it's uh, by First Fish Games and Get Off My Land. So I'll just give you a brief a description. So it's a game where you are a farmer competing with other farmers for limited resources in space. The most successful farmer wins the game. There are actions like expanding your, la your land, gaining income, and borrowing from your neighbor. I'm totally into this game because it's a game that looks fun and interactive. That's really big for me when I'm trying to back Kickstarters. And also looks like it takes from a variety of games to create their interesting gameplay. Uh, additionally, the Canadian dollar price point also made it a plus for me. This was also a game that was uh, previously on Kickstarter canceled and they restarted, but I noticed they made some adjustments to the price point and their goal, which was definitely something that appealed to me. So overall looks like a winner and I believe they've achieved their goal and then their goal and then some. So even though we didn't intend for this to be all about Canadians because we're Canadians, <laughs> <laughs> it these just are our way. Canadian picks. <laughs> So uh, that's it for now. We'll be back in a couple weeks with two more Kickstarters that we love or need some love. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Hello, everyone. This is Graham Anderson. And in this segment, I want to look at some of the lesser known Kickstarter campaigns that may have fallen under the radar, but I still felt had something interesting to offer. Today's game is The Taking of Tydenon. Now this is a combative deck builder game which each player has a unique character which has special abilities. Now the theme itself is kind of one way or the other. You are a group of low-life mercenaries who are working for different corporations and governments who are trying to be the first person or team to get towards a scientist who has developed a way to fuse energy with the human body to make them more powerful. Now in this game, table talk is greatly encouraged. You can either work as a team 
or you can go off by yourselves and use in-game negotiations to try and build up teams within the game. But remember, backstabbing is always allowed and encouraged. Now, what I found the most interesting part about this game is the mechanics itself. The theme, you can take it or leave it. But the mechanism of having a combative deck builder game with special powers is not something I'd seen a lot, so it kind of interested me. The other part I liked about the game was it, it looks as if you have two options on your turn. You can either attack a player or you can purchase upgrades for your cards. You can't do both. You're having to choose which way you want to play your turn. And even when you are attacked by someone else on their turn, you have the option to defend yourself. But the cards you defend yourself with are discarded and you will have a reduced number of cards in your hand when it becomes your turn. And like any deck builder, it's not until the end of your turn that you draw a new set of cards. Now, I did like the art style. It looks cartoony and light. I thought it looked well with the theme, and it is a style that I like. Now, if this sounds interesting, I cannot vouch for this game, and I have not played this game. I'm going strictly by what's on the Kickstarter campaign. But if it does look interesting, I encourage you to check out the official Kickstarter campaign and check out for yourself whether it's something you'd want to back. As always, thanks for watching. Hey, folks, thanks again for joining me. Thank you to all the contributors of the show who talked about this and uh, with thanks to Andy Boards and Cards for uh, sponsoring the show. Guys, we're going to try to keep doing this on a bi-weekly basis where we just go through. It's not always going to be bi-weekly. Sometimes we might be off by a few days just because of conventions and things like that. But we want to talk about what's coming out. We want to say, this looks neat, this doesn't look neat, and we want to just be straight with it, or at least coming from the same thing. If you see something interesting, you say, Tom, look at this. And that's what we're trying to do here. We're saying, hey, look at that. It looks pretty cool. Hopefully some things here caught your interest. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Crowd Surfing. <laughs>